Good morning. morning. How you all doing? I'm all right. I'm doing okay right now. I'll let you know if anything changes. (laughs) If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I'm also, as usual, excited to be continuing in our Corinthian series. This is where we are looking at the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, letters actually from the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, where, you know it, they're experiencing issues, things are going wrong, I guess, there. So we're asking the overlying question throughout this entire series, are we any different today? We've got our answer by now, but we're going to keep going. I want to draw your attention to a few things before we begin. First of all, The app. I've been talking a lot about the app because it is like C3 Church in your pocket. There's a lot you can do with the app. If you haven't downloaded it, I suggest that you do. It's not mandatory, but it helps. My sermon notes are in there, so as it pertains to the message, you can follow along and get extra information that I do not have time for on a Sunday morning. Also, I will reference certain things. The links for your convenience have been added to the app. In addition to that, midweek Bible study, Wednesday night, 6 p.m., you're all invited. We'd have to move it down here. It's in the ballroom, if you all came. (laughs) 6 p.m., it's for beginners, it's for advanced people. Everyone is welcome. All levels are welcome. We talk about the application there. The application is the same for all of us, whether you've read the Bible or not. It all applies to all of us. The Bible study application questions are in the app, so you can use it for that as well. I want to take a moment and talk about missions, just for a short minute here, or three. We have like a three-tier missional philosophy here at C3. We believe in local missions. We believe that the church is a mission. Our duty is to spread the gospel and to love our neighbors. So we spread the gospel here at the church and out in our community. We also take opportunities like breakfast in the park, Saturday's East Naples Community Park. We feed our community, and it presents us with opportunities. Here, after every worship service, we will feed you. We have a cool cafe-type area we call the loft. Anyone who wants or needs a meal can get one right after the service. It's here for you. We also believe in long-range missions. This is why we will be hearing from Doug Barclay, I believe the first Sunday in March. He is from Mission India. We appreciate those guys there and what they're doing. What I want to talk about this morning, though, is what I like to think of as a mid-range mission trip. That is Penny Farms, about five hours north, not out of the country, but far away, or enough away to get you out of your comfort zone just a little bit. However, if you go, you will not be sleeping in a tent in the woods or anything like that. You will be in a motel room. It's kind of comfortable. It's kind of nice there. The meals, they're pretty good. I think you get, what, one meal voucher a day, and maybe you have to pay for two meals, so it's not too expensive. The food is pretty good. March 22nd through 26th. There are eight spots available, so if you want to sign up for this mission trip, don't wait. Do so ASAP. What you'll be doing when you go there is putting together these pets, personal energy transportation vehicles. You can run them with your hands and get to test them out after you help make them. You work at certain stations. It's kind of fun. You don't need any kind of like carpentry or mechanical experience to do it at all. No jokes about my wife being able to do it. I want to get myself, nobody laughed, that's scary. Uh, (laughs) So anyway, you'll be putting these things together. You'll be the hands and feet of Jesus for these people who do not have legs. In a lot of countries where there have been wars, they have landmines left over. It's actually a pretty big problem. People unfortunately lose their legs. So this is a real blessing to them. If you want to go, Brian, raise your hand. Brian and Ann Martin, they're heading this up. See Brian after the worship service. And he will tell you how to get all signed up. Or his email is there on the screen and in the app. You guessed it. One more short thing. Last week, I told a joke about a parakeet. And I had it pre-planned. The parakeet joke, I thought about it the week before as I was preparing my message. Got pre-approved by my wife so that I wouldn't embarrass myself. All jokes need pre-approval. But a funny thing happened. I mentioned it briefly. 
But I need time to really absorb this. It was kind of a God incident. Evelyn came up to me before the worship service in the lobby, and she said, I got a parakeet. You're very excited about your parakeet. <clears throat> and I said, that's really funny. What a coincidence, because I'm going to tell a joke about a parakeet. She probably didn't believe me, but I did it anyway. Then it got even funnier. <clears throat> she said, it's an albino parakeet, and its name is Daisy. Daisy. That's right. And so I said, that's really crazy, because I too have a pet. She's not a parakeet. She's a dog, but she's all white, and her name is Daisy. Daisy. God's funny. Isn't that interesting? So what are the chances? I've never talked about parakeets on a Sunday morning before, in the lobby or on the stage. What are the chances of that happening alone? Much less the pet being all white and also of the same name. Had to share that one. It was very, very exciting to me during the week. God has a funny, funny sense of humor, huh? <clears throat> All right, we find ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 this morning. Much like 1 Corinthians, there are overlying chapter themes. There's always a purpose for writing the letter. Paul's going to have a reason for writing. So like, for example, Philippians, he's thanking them for a gift. That's the reason for writing. But the real point within the letter is be like Jesus. And there's some beautiful theology in there. So we get the same thing in 2 Corinthians. Main reasons for writing... Titus, he sent in Titus back and forth to collect a gift, an offering for the church in Jerusalem. They're having a little trouble there. Historians say there's a grain shortage or something going on, so they need money. So he's going around collecting this offering. We see this in Acts as well. The other reason, false teachers, very common in Paul's letter. It's a problem there. And as Paul does, he'll digress, right? He'll kind of go off course for a little bit and talk about something that's not within the theme. It's a little bit different. So that's where we're going to hang this morning. Paul will digress about forgiveness, and that is where we're going to hang. But I want to give you a little background <clears throat> in case you're just joining us or you weren't at this part in the whole series. I want to talk to you about 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and a specific situation that happens there. There's the guy in sin. He's doing something gross. He's sleeping with his stepmother. And I told you how this might happen when we were in that part. Back then, the mortality rate was higher than it was today, especially for women in childbirth. They didn't have hospitals, modern medicine, things would go wrong, and a lot of women would pass away. Also, men married women sometimes much younger than them. All right, that was very common back then. So you could have a situation where you could have a man in his 30s Marrying a teenage girl, not unusual. Maybe it's the second wife. Maybe he has a son from the first wife, and now you've got two teenagers in the same household with raging hormones. No bueno. Right? So that's maybe how this happened. Anyway, he's doing that. It's wrong. We think that they went through the reconciliation process. Paul writes to them and says, kick him out of the church. He's gone. He's done because he's not stopping it. That's why. I like to think that this part in 2 Corinthians is that sinner forgiven. I have a few reasons for that. One, well, he's a nameless guy. We know that Paul doesn't have any problem calling people out by name. If you read a lot of Paul's letters, you hear Deanimus, Alexander the coppersmith. He has no problem <laughs> calling people out and telling the truth about them. He doesn't in both of these cases. Two, if you know me, you know I like early church history. I love to study the early church fathers because I believe that most of the time, the water is purest closer to the source. You get the better information. They might have new people who knew people who knew people. The early church fathers pretty much unanimously agree that this is the same guy. So maybe they knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and they figured it out. The main reason I like to think the same guys, because if it is, we see reconciliation taking place, and that's the point. We see forgiveness, right? It's not a loose end. It's not just this guy kicked out of the church, and that's it. We see reconciliation. We see it coming full circle. That's what we want here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the text. 
2 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 5. Paul writes, If anyone has caused pain, he has caused pain not so much to me, but to some degree, not to exaggerate, to all of you. The punishment inflicted by the majority is sufficient for that person. As a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, this one may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. I wrote for this purpose to test your character, to see if you are obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for you in the presence of Christ. So we see that Paul may be referring to that other letter. He tested them to see if they'd be obedient and kick the guy out of the church. I like to think they did and that he came back. Look at that comfort there. Remember that from last week, comforting people. We are commanded to forgive. It's an absolute mandate. And I remember before the holidays, I knew it was going to get stressful. Right? So I wanted to talk about forgiving people and relationship boundaries and things like that. We're in these, all these social situations with family that we don't normally see, but once a year for good reason. So I talked about that and how we can forgive with boundaries. So I want you to remember this, that forgiving someone doesn't mean letting them do whatever they want. That's not what forgiveness means. We can have forgiveness with boundaries. That's okay. You don't have to give people the opportunity to provoke you to sin. You also have to give people the opportunity to be enabled, to keep doing it. No, it's not what it says. But the forgiveness, that part is mandatory, regardless of what boundaries you've set up. Now, Jesus taught on boundaries. We've looked at this text recently, but it's worth just another look to review. Matthew 18, 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won a brother. That's the point. But if you won't listen, but, but if you won't listen, take one or two more with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention to even the church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. There are times when someone has to be removed from our lives. But the forgiveness, the love and forgiveness in our heart is absolutely mandatory. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The purpose is gaining a brother. That's what we want, or sister. Notice, if you have a Bible, this teaching is immediately followed by two teachings on forgiveness. So Jesus Doubles, triples down on this thing here. You can forgive someone from far, but you must love and forgive them. Look what happens. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter's got a number. As many as seven. I'm just throwing that out there, Jesus. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but seven times seven. And Jesus has got a bigger number. He's kind of funny like that, right? 490 times, if I'm doing my math right, I don't know. Then there's another teaching. <clears throat> and I kind of want to explain this to you because I don't think that the English text does it any justice. There are a couple little problems with it. So here's the situation. You have a king, and he wants to settle his accounts. So he gets up a slave, or we imagine his slaves. The slave could, should kind of be thought of like a servant, a tax collector perhaps. What happened back then, if you were a tax collector working for a king, is you'd be sent out to collect taxes from all the people in a certain area. And you would owe the king, in this case, all that money, whether you collected it or not. Pretty stressful job. So you got to have some money in the bank <laughs> to cover people once in a while. That's why they didn't like tax collectors. That's what Jesus says. Treat them like a tax collector. They hated them back then. All right, so... Imagine that this is probably the scenario going on. So the slave goes to the king, and he doesn't have the money. But there's a point about the money that Jesus wants you to understand. In your Bible, it probably says 10,000 talents. That's what he owed the king, 10,000 talents. 
Some versions say millions of dollars, like NLT, which I think is a little better. Because in my mind, I don't know about you, but 10,000 talents makes me think like, okay, is it $10,000 or 10,000 bags of gold? Like, what is that? Okay, it's a finite number. It's something that I could wrap my mind around. The problem with that translation, unless you know what a talent is, is that it's myriadha in Greek. Myriad. A countless number. That's what it actually says. Let's say 10,000, it says myriad. You can translate myriad into 10,000, but I won't get into that right now. It's a way of thinking about it. That's why millions of dollars is, is better. Millions and millions. Because Jesus wants you to understand that there's no way this guy could pay back the money. It's also funny. It would be funny to the initial listeners of this parable because there's no way the person would even collect that much money in a region. All right? So a myriad, it's huge. It's just a countless number, countless number. He owes it to the king. The king wants to just sell his family, put the guy in jail, and have him tortured so he can pay everything back. The slave begs, begs for forgiveness. The king relents. The king has compassion and forgives the debt. So this would be unbelievable. Right? It would be like me saying, somebody owed somebody else a billion dollars, and the guy just forgave it. Not only that, he's not a slave anymore. He set him free. Whoa, that's some grace right there, isn't it? Now that slave, the forgiven one, goes out, meets another slave, a fellow slave, who owes him three months' pay, 100 denarii. Like, not much, comparatively. Now, if you hear this with the 10,000 number in mind, maybe you might think, oh, okay, so he owed him half as much. No. (laughs) Nothing. Like a speck compared to what he owed the king, a countless number. So it's a number that you could say, "Eh, I could come up with three months' pay if I really tried. He won't forgive it. The second slave does the same thing the first slave does. He begs him. Nope. Says. He grabs him by the throat and chokes him. And says, no. Has him thrown into prison. It's orchard. The other slaves, mind blown. They go back. They tell the king. The king finds out about it. And this is what Jesus says happens. Matthew 18, 34. And his master, or the king, right? The original king is what it says in Greek. Got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to each, if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So you get the point. The king is like God. We're like that forgiven slave, the first one. Countless sins against God. Not 10,000 sins. We do 10,000 sins in maybe like a month or a year, if you're me, a week. (laughs) All right? Countless. A countless number of sins against God. The point of the story is, if we've been forgiven like that, how much more should we forgive someone who's done one, two, three things against us? That's the point of the story. Forgiveness. So yeah, there's a reconciliation process. Yes, there's church discipline. Yes, we have to create boundaries sometimes. But we must forgive. It's mandatory and it comes with huge consequences if we don't. So, the question, how do we do that? Especially when it's difficult. Really hard in some cases. Really hard. Well, there's some practical keys and there's some spiritual keys. Practical. We must love them. We must walk a mile in their shoes. We must see things from their perspective. We need to understand them. We need to get ourselves out of our own head and start thinking like, what might this person be going through that they did this? It's not all about me. Right? Remember what I said? Deny yourself, Jesus says. <laughs> Take up your cross, then follow me. Self-denial. If you've been with us for a while, you'll remember. <clears throat> I said it would be kind of cool in one of my messages. I can't remember which one, but it would be kind of cool if the Holy Spirit would give us the ability to see, instead of like a name on a name tag, what that person was going through. Imagine that. We've all been mad at a waiter or waitress for getting our order wrong. But what if we saw what they were going through? What about, like I gave the example, a bumper sticker on a car, and I gave a whole bunch of different examples. Anybody ever cut you off? What do you do when you get cut off? Honestly, (laughs) you lay on the horn, but that's not all, (laughs) right? You say some bad words and things like that, right? What if 
the person cut you off, but before you got the opportunity to do it, you saw in their bumper sticker, it said, taking spouse to the hospital. Ooh, that might stop you, right? Oh, man. Anybody who's ever done that knows it's scary. You don't care about cutting people off, stop signs, lights, nothing. Years ago, my wife, she drove me to the hospital. I think we got there. It's like a 10-minute ride. We got there in two minutes. Scary. She probably ran a few lights and cut some people off. But if everybody around her knew what was going on, they'd be like, oh, move over. They might help. That's what we do, right? When we see an ambulance coming, that's what we do. What about our, wait- our waitress or our waiter? Right? We get angry with them. Maybe we tip them less because we have to police the world. That's how we feel sometimes. Uh, this happened last Sunday. If you know me, you know I can't eat onions. No bueno. <laughs> no good. It's like eating a box of tacks for me. It hurts my stomach bad. You want to kill me? Give me onions. There you go. <laughs> if this happened to me, <clears throat> another thing I don't like, when waiters or waitresses don't write my order down. I don't know why they just don't use the pad sometimes. Maybe they think like they're showing off, like it's impressive, but I'd be more impressed if they just wrote it down and got my order right. So I'm already bothered. I'm ordering my food. The waitress is, "Uh uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And I'm just, you know, tick, tick, like thinking like, you're not going to get this right, but I don't say anything. You do this. I even give the option. I even say, can this be made without the onions? You know, I figured, I'm being nice here. Yes, it can be made without the onions. Fantastic. Do that. Also, salt. All right, so restaurant food, it has so much sodium in it. You don't need extra salt. All right, so now you got, like, wives nudging their husband. You don't need extra salt. So I say, no extra salt. Well, you know what happens, right? Of course, the food comes out with all the onions in it and salt all over everything. <sighs> okay, you know... So I just picked the onions out, and then I didn't avoid all the food with salt on it. I ate it. It was good. (laughs) Whatever. Thanks for that one, lady. But anyway, we tip the normal 20%. That's our floor. I'm just saying, not bragging, but that's just what we do. I'd suggest you do that. If they do better, we give more. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe she had a bad day. Maybe she's going through something. She's distracted. Maybe she lost her pad. Maybe there's a bully at work who hit it on her or something like that. I don't know. But you got to think about these things. Now, the police out there, (laughs) those of you who like to police the world, you'll say, well, you know, she's got to learn a lesson. You know, or, you know, if you really love the restaurant, you got to let them know. Yeah, there are a lot of other ways to do that besides ruining her day with a bad tip or getting her fired. A lot of other ways. One, I'll give you an example. You could send an email. Pray about it. Wait till the next day. That's a key, guys. If you're going to send an email, wait a day. Maybe show it to someone else. Have like an accountability partner on the email. But send the email to the restaurant. Don't include your name so that, you know, you don't get spit in your food next time you go to the restaurant. But maybe say something like, hey, I love your restaurant. Always start with a compliment and then you know what comes next. But, and then everything else is really what matters. You may want to tell your waiters and waitresses to write down the orders because they keep getting it wrong. And don't put a name there. (laughs) Don't put a name. That's it. If you really want to help the restaurant, if that's really your intention, think about it. So maybe Holy Spirit would give us the ability in certain circumstances, pray for this, to kind of see what's going on. Maybe you could ask. You say, hey, how you doing? Can I pray for you? Most people, even non-believers, they'll accept prayer. Can I pray? Is there anything I can pray for you about? Disarming. You'll see the whole thing change. Ultimately, we want to forgive. <clears throat> Not only that, but we want reconciliation. Like I said in the beginning, we want to see this thing come full circle. So, when boundaries aren't necessary, we must welcome people back into our lives with open arms. Paul talks about this. There's a key in that too. We can't keep beating them over, up over it. That's a big key. We often do this in our marriages. And I'll talk about that in a couple minutes, but here's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 2.7. As a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. So this guy being welcomed back into the church. Otherwise, this one may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. They don't need to continually beat up over it. We do that. 
excessive grief, so long as they've stopped what they were doing and proven that they've changed. Oftentimes, they're beating themselves up over it, and we're just adding to it. That's no good. We can make that worse. Moving past it is an important part of the healing process. Once a person has truly changed, that needs to be gauged and defined. It's important. The burden of proof is on them. I've talked about this a little bit, but it's kind of important. <clears throat> a lot of times, people will want to continue doing what they were doing, right? They want to put up a front, like, here's fake me, the one that you asked for, right? Like an order. <laughs> so you told them what you want them to be, and they're like, okay, I'm going to pretend to be this, but on the back end, I'm going to keep doing all the same stuff. And they do something. In order to continue doing it, if you call them out, they make themselves the victim. They'll do that. Well, just stop beating me up. When are we going to get over this? When are we going to get past this? Is this going to follow me around forever? Well, yeah, as long as you keep doing what you were doing in the first place. Uh-huh. It's okay to say that. You're not the victim. They are. But if they've really proven it, they're genuine, which means they're not doing all that stuff anymore, yes, we have to move on. And sometimes it should be rather immediate. And I'll talk about that in a minute, especially in our marriages. The devil uses that stuff. Every repentant sinner is deserving of that comfort I was talking about. I want to talk just for a minute about the five love languages. Tell me well. You know I like the five love languages. Gary Chapman, I believe, is the author of that. You can get the book. You can go online and you can take the test. There's like a quiz. It's not a long test. Don't be scared. I recommend this a lot in marriages for married couples, that you both take it and you find out what the other person's love language is. The idea here is that we all receive love in different ways, sometimes the same ways, but different ways. And we have like a main couple of love languages, ways in which we want to receive love. And quite often in marriages, what people will do is they will give the other person the love language they want. Right? So it's like giving someone else a gift that you don't want. You know, you know what I mean? And, and, and the other person won't, they won't feel the love. So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I notice that a lot of men, their love language is physical touch. It's just how men are wired sometimes, most of the time, I, I think. Women, gifts. Women like gifts a lot of times. That's not always the case, but this is common. And for my example, it'll help you understand. Let's say husband's at home, the wife coming home, he knows she had a bad day. So she comes home, and he's like, oh, honey, you had a bad day. And he runs up to her, and he starts hugging her and touching her, and she's like, oh, get off me. Just buy me some jewelry. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, that's what's going on here. If you bought her a gift, it would be good. All right? Then he can do the hugging and touching later. <clears throat> Let's say... <laughs> Let's say the wife is at home, right? Waiting for the husband to come and maybe he called. He had a bad day. Something bad happened at work. He's a waiter, right? So he hid his notepad. He's having a really bad day. He comes home and he just wants a hug. She says, honey, I know you had a bad day. And so he's like, and she says, so I bought you a lawnmower. There you go. That should make you feel really good, right? You get my point. Check out the five love languages. One thing I noticed as a pastor is that words of affirmation are kind of important. Right? So that's one of my love languages, not in ministry, but in marriage. I like words of affirmation. I really do. But it's not just me. I notice in forgiveness and reconciliation, they're kind of important. And I learned more about this from reading the Bible. Because Paul, 2 Corinthians 2.8, Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love. Now, you can do this with other love languages, right? Like if you know this dude's love language, you can give him gifts or whatever it is. But it's also important to say it. You want to hear it sometimes. And it can be followed up if the person has another love language. As I said before, forgiveness is important so that Satan doesn't have more opportunities. What do you mean more? Why would we want to give Satan any opportunities in the first place? Well, Look at 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the original situation as I see it. Paul says, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. If someone won't 
won't listen to good godly advice or instruction, yeah, sometimes they have to be removed from us. Why? What was the point? So we could hit bottom. That was the point. Remember last week I talked about successful sobriety stories. They included what? Surrender. That surrender happened usually because the person hit bottom. So the guy wouldn't listen. Paul's like, all right, Satan will deal with him and hopefully he'll hit a bottom. And I hope he came back as a result. It worked. <clears throat> Once they have hit the bottom and changed, if they've changed, it is us to welcome them in. As I said before, 2 Corinthians 2.10, if you forgive anyone, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for you in the presence of Christ. I have done this, there's the so that, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So I mentioned marriages, right? That's where we want to do it quick if possible. If possible, as long as they've changed, again, we want to do that quick. And this is more for the little stuff. This is like the little things, right? Like you didn't do the dishes or something like that. And then what do you do? You turn your backs to one another. You don't talk to one another. Really petty stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Satan uses that. He'll use that. Remember the text last week. <clears throat> I jumped over to 1 Corinthians 7. Do not deprive one another sexually. Paul's talking about marriages. He's dealing with marriage. Except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Why? Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Here's the thing. Our fight is not with each other. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We'll hop over to Ephesians. But within that letter, we see that Paul reiterates a lot of these things in that letter. You're going to see a whole bunch of stuff if you read the letter that's similar to what I'm saying. <clears throat> he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? So that you don't give the devil an opportunity. Verse 26 and 27. Verse 32. Forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Jesus. Themes that we're seeing. He continues. And he says this. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and His vast strength. Put the full armor of God on so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore with the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. We need to equip ourselves with the armor of God, with the things of God, so that we can thwart the enemies. Schemes. He is trying to convince us that the problem is with each other, not him. <laughs> He's deflecting, being very manipulative. We got to watch it. So, we need to behave righteously. Bottom line, all for the mission, the spreading of the gospel. We are vehicles of the gospel and ambassadors of Christ. We should think of ourselves like that at all times. It makes us think about our behavior. We're protected in our faith that comes from the gospel. That is our hope and our confidence. We have the knowledge of salvation. That is the ultimate comfort for us. And we fight this battle with the Word of God. This armor is refined by the fire of the Holy Spirit, forged by prayer. Paul continues to write, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert. In this, with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. That's you, holy, Agia. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make it known with boldness, make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this, I am an ambassador in chains. That's Paul in prison. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should also. Pray that we be filled enough with the Holy Spirit to be given the strength when it's difficult to forgive spiritually. Practically, I 
pray that we have it on the front of our minds that we are that forgiven slave. The forgiven slave who's committed, what a multitude, countless sins against God, yet He has grace and mercy over us. How much more should we have for everyone else? Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you.